Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Yesterday, I got a piece of paper out, and for the first time, I wrote 1-2-21. And I got to be honest, it did feel really, really good to do that. So, if you're at home, you can answer this question on the, the chat box, and if you're in the room, you can just raise your hand. But I want to know, a few days ago, on Christmas Eve, if, you, if you're at home, I actually want you to type in what time you went to bed. We're going to take a little poll here. And if you're in the room, just a quick show of hands, how many of you stayed up to midnight to welcome the new year? And then how many of you went to bed and did not care about welcoming the new year? Okay. I made it to 11.50 and then I fell asleep. I was so, I was so, so disappointed in myself. Let me give you one more image that I think summarizes the year that we just left, 2020. Three snows ago, so like three weeks ago, my, my girls and I, we worked really hard all, all Sunday afternoon to build quite a snowman. And, and we named him Snowgrid. He was a giant. Uh, we named him after the character Hagrid from Harry Potter. And we were very, very proud of this creation. He was 10 feet tall. In hindsight, we probably should have named him Marshmallow Man because that's what he looks like. Now, had we built this snowman in 2021, I think he would have had a long life. But we built him in 2020. And so, sadly, Snow Grid only lasted 30 minutes. It was very, very sad. Uh, this is what Snow Grid uh, became. It was actually, I actually found it very funny because... We built him right by our living room window on purpose so that we could just look out whenever we wanted to and see him. And so my girls were actually standing right at the window just gazing up at him right at the moment that he fell. And so it was this just towering, just boom! And Hagrid or Snowgrid slammed into the window, guaranteed nightmares for the girls. It was very, very, very sad. But that's 2020. You work really hard everything falls apart. Our hopes, our dreams, our relationships, our bodies, our finances, a lot of it came crashing to the ground. And as we begin the new year, I want to highlight a particular anxiety that a lot of us have felt. I've felt this. I've actually heard a lot of you say this. I think it's in the heartbeat of our church right now. And it's a simple question, will we actually recover we hope we will, but there's this fear of like, well, what if we don't? Because here, here's the reality. Let's just be honest. <laughs> a lot of us have built some really bad habits in 2020. We didn't want to. We didn't plan on it, but it happened. So, for example, some of us have, <laughs> we've become really, really bad at loving other people. And the reason is we, we've had to isolate and at first we social distance because of safety reasons, but some of you, you probably wouldn't admit it out loud, but now you social distance not just because of safety reasons, but because of selfish reasons. You've got so used to a life where you really don't have to do anything for other people, and you've got used to a life where all you can think about is yourself, and so now you have this super bad habit of thinking about yourself first. A lot of us are in that boat. Uh, some of us, our, our bad habit is that the isolation has drawn us into addiction. Whether that's pornography or some other coping mechanism, some of you are stuck in the middle of something and you, you just can't get out of it. You're not even sure what to do about it. Uh, for those, others of you, it's the bad habit for you is that your free time quickly translated into wasted time. And so now, you, day to day, you're, you're lazier than you've been in a really long time. It's a bad habit. Or, or what about this one? Watching church became skipping church. Because it's really easy to skip church when all you have to do is push a button. And so for a lot of people, they started out in the room. And then when 2020 hit, they went into their living rooms. But then that got hard. And so for some of us, we go week in, week out, and we don't have the regular singing and the regular scripture that bring our hearts to life, and now we're stuck in it. 
And so what we're all wondering is, do we recover? Like, can we get out of this? Or are these new habits so ingrained in our brain that the new habit is simply going to become the new normal? Will we recover? I want to tell you about another day that I remember from 2020, and everybody remembers this day. It was October 26, 2020. It was the first day of the ice storm. And we looked at our city and drove around, and we saw scenes like this, and it was just really sad. I remember thinking that all the trees are just mourning what has happened in 2020, and limbs were bending and limbs were breaking, and entire canopies were just bent over into the ground. But I also remember what happened on October 27th. Well, before I tell you about that, actually, let me show you one picture of my tree. I have a really pretty tree, and ironically, just like two days before the ice storm, I took a picture of it. When my, the leaves turn color in my front yard tree, it just, it's a beautiful tree. <laughs> so that, that's what it was like two days before the ice storm. And then when the ice storm hit, here's what it became. But we all dealt with this. And we were all sad on that day. But on October 27th, I, I distinctly remember that the sun came out. And that didn't mean that everything snapped back into place immediately, and it didn't mean that branches and limbs and leaves all grew back to the trees. But I do distinctly remember that the trees started to bend towards the light, and I was filled with hope. I didn't exactly know why trees did this, so I, I looked it up. It's, in, in science, it's called phototropism. Photo means light. Tropism means turning. And so trees have this substance called oxen in them, and, and what it does is it actually helps trees bend towards the light. And so isn't that amazing that, that even though these, these trees were bent and they were broken and they were in some ways shattered onto the ground, they still had this something inside of them put there by God where they would turn back to the light. It's like trees knew that the way that they would become who they were supposed to be is to, to turn back. And so I actually am I'm filled with hope because, yes, it was a hard year, and yes, it was a frustrating year, but if creation knows how to turn back to the light, then so do we. We are made in the image of God. We are therefore, we have the ability to be remade in the image of God. I believe that just like a tree, we can turn back to the light. In fact, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is Philippians 1, 6, where where Paul says that God who begins a good work in us is going to carry it on to completion. And I love this verse because it says God's the one working. He's, he's the one in charge of your own spiritual formation and he hasn't stopped working. And so yes, many of us have, have, have gone into to hibernation when it comes to our spiritual lives, but there's something in your heart that will come back to fruition. You have the ability to come out of hibernation because God is not done working on you. And so today, as Andy said, we're starting a new series. It's called Refresh, because we all need to be refreshed. And I'm super excited about this series. In fact, a quick preview for next week. Next week, I'm actually going to start preaching one simple habit at a time for about five six weeks. And the goal is not that you get every single habit and you make it your habit for the whole year, but I I'm going to give you one habit per week. And by the end of the whole series, I just want you to have one. One of them that you've really taken to heart and made your own. Now, uh, for today, that this introductory message, we're, we're, I'm not going to tell you a specific habit. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a little bit bigger picture. I want to give you some trajectory for the year. I don't know if you're a New Year's resolution person or if you're a word of the year person, but about six weeks ago, I was reading a fantastic book called The Circle Maker by uh, Mark Batterton, and I got to this chapter, and he had these three goals, and I read them and thought, those are fantastic. And so I've started to apply them to my own life, and so that, if you want to learn more about this, you can, you can read that book. And I, I've tweaked the wording and, and changed quite a, a few of the, th the details, but, but that, that book is the source of this. But I want to give you three goals. If you've already made your goals, you can add one of these to the list. If, you, if you're not a goal person, I would really encourage you to add at least one of these to, to your list because they're so, they're just so good. Here's the first one. It's very simple. Do the best you can with what you have where you are. Do the best you can with what you have where you are. I, I'm reminded of a great story in the Bible, Mark 14. This woman, 
she comes into this, this Pharisee's house and there's a dinner going on and she has this expensive a jar of perfume and she walks over to Jesus and she pours the perfume over his head. And all the people in the room react probably the way that you and I would react, which is pretty frustrated. Like, I'm not going to be happy in this moment. One, the, the scent is going to be overwhelming. But even more than that, it really does seem like a waste. Like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars just going down the drain. So everybody's upset because this woman, she comes in and she wastes this perfume on Jesus. And then Jesus, he shuts everyone up with five words. I love these five words. He says, she did what she could. She did what she could. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, you know what? Like if she'd had a house, maybe she could have invited me into her home, but she didn't have a house or she didn't have a big house. And if she'd had influence, maybe she could have used the influence to get the Pharisees off Jesus' back, but she didn't have influence. What she had was she had a jar of perfume and a heart for worship. And she gave it to Jesus and he acknowledges that she does what she can. Here's a goal that you can make for yourself. Do the best with what you have where you are. In fact, let me share with you a bad habit that I have. And my guess is sometimes you have this bad habit too. Sometimes I fret about what I can't do instead of focusing on what I can do. So, so for easy example here, like think about the last time someone you love was sick or they had a problem. How did you respond to that? Well, if you're like me, you might have had thoughts like this. Well, if, da, 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 then. You played the if-then game. So, so if I had a more flexible job, I could take off more time. If I made more money, then I could just write a check and fix this person's problem. If I wasn't quarantined, then I could help this person. Or if I wasn't so young, or if I wasn't so old, or if I didn't have this going on, or if I didn't have that going on, if I didn't have this health problem, then I could blah, blah, blah. And, and we play this if-then game when we try to respond to other people's problems. But what happens is, like, nothing happens. Because the if-then game is always theoretical, and you can't solve real-world problems with theoretical mind games. And so if, if you're like me, you know this. You, you probably had moments this past year or maybe recently where you fretted about what you couldn't do instead of focusing on what you could do. See, I love this story with Jesus and this woman for a lot of reasons. One is I love those five words, she did what she could. But I also love something else Jesus says about this woman. So she pours the perfume on, on, on Jesus' head and everybody gets mad. And then he says this, he says, she has done a beautiful thing. She's done a beautiful thing for me. See, this is, this is so important. God does not hold you accountable for what you do not have. God doesn't hold you accountable for what you don't have. But I do think he called, holds you accountable for what you do have. And so instead of fretting about who you're not and what you don't have and the money you don't have and the job you don't have, focus on, right on where you are. So, so even if you're stuck at home, do the best you can with what you have where you are. Or maybe you're a student and you don't even want to go back to school because you don't like school right now. Do the best you can with what you have where you are. It could be that tomorrow you're going to a job that you wish you could quit and you wish someone would just call you today and offer you a different job because you can't stand going to, you, to your work. Do the best you can with what you have, where you are. Here's the uh, second, second uh, goal I want to share with you this morning. Oh, I love this one. Help people maximize their God-given potential. Help people maximize their God-given potential. And by this one, I actually mean like people pretty close to you. I want you to think about you, your mom, your dad, your, your, your kids, your siblings, like your roommate, your best friend. Help those people maximize their God-given potential because you got you to realize that everybody you know is on their own spiritual journey. And they have their good days and they have their bad days and they have their big victories and triumphs and they've got their temptations and they've got the things that are pulling them astray and, and you impact that journey. 
Like for good or for bad, you actually shape other people's journeys. And so what would it be like if you spent a year saying, you know what, I'm going to make sure that the people closest to me know God better because of the way that I live my life. Like what a year that would be if you maximize the, the spiritual potential in the people around you. I've, I've always been amazed at Paul's prayers and I, mainly for two reasons. I want, I want to read you a, a prayer of his and then I'll share with you why I love his prayers. So this is from Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says this, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so you can know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. So one reason I love Paul's prayers is because of the language he uses. Spirit of, of wisdom and spirit of revelation. I, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Like those are, I just love the, the words he uses. And I've preached on this before and I, I try as best I can to adopt the language of Paul into my own prayer life because it's always just so challenging. Now here's the second reason I love Paul's prayers. It's because he's not... He's not praying these amazing words for himself. He's praying these words for other people. Like it's one thing for you in your prayer life to say, oh Lord, would you open the eyes of my heart so I can be enlightened to the things that you know? And would you give me the spirit of, of wisdom and give me the spirit of revelation? Like it's one thing to pray that, but now imagine praying that prayer for your sister or for your best friend. You see, to me, that, that even unlocks a deeper level of spiritual maturity, which is to pray the deepest prayers you know how to pray, not just for yourself, but for somebody else. That's what Paul's trying to do here. He is trying to unlock the spiritual potential of the people he loves the most. And the cool thing is you can do this. Like, I can do this. Like, you can set the people you love the most up to succeed. And, and the way you do is, is you start by by recognizing what their spiritual strength is. So I want you to think about the, your family and your friends. What is their spiritual strength? Like, are they an encourager? Are they a leader? Are they a teacher? Do they, do they really work well behind the scenes? Like, what is it that they're good at? And once you figure out what they're good at, set them up to knock it out of the park. Like, you have the capacity to do this. Get creative on how you could give an opportunity to someone you love where they could just crush it. Like, wouldn't it be an incredible year if you made this your goal? I'm going to maximize the spiritual potential of other people. I did a wedding a few years ago and sat down with a couple. And, and, and I do this with all my weddings. We talk about what I'm going to say in the ceremony. And I, and I ask them, say, well, well, do you have your favorite Bible verses you want me to read? Or, you know, great words from Scripture about marriage. And I give them a few options of, of ones that I personally love. 1 Corinthians 13, it's amazing. Or, or Ephesians 5 or Genesis 2. And I read several scriptures. And I said, well, what do you want? And they said, well, we actually want Romans 1.11. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, Romans 1.11. And you know, in my head, I'm like, I have no idea what Romans 1.11 says. So I turned to Romans 1.11. Here's what it says. It's Paul, it's Paul to the Romans, and he says this. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Wow, what a verse! <laughs> the reason that Paul wants to see these people isn't just so they can shoot the breeze and have some fun and laugh and just create joy. Like, Paul wants to see these people so he can, he can do something to make them spiritually strong. Like, he wants to maximize the spiritual potential in the people he loves the most. And so right now, I just want you to think about something you could do to bring out the spiritual potential in someone you love. Like, let, let me paint a picture here. Wouldn't this be amazing in your life? At some point, maybe this year, maybe it's five years down the road, but someone you love writes you a letter or that they call you and they say this, I know God better because of you. I mean, don't you want that to be your story? But what I'm saying is that doesn't happen by accident. If you want to bring out the spiritual potential in other people, it requires a plan. 
And you can do that this year. Now, before I tell you the third goal, I want to share a story. So to review, first goal, do the best you can with what you have where you are. Second goal, maximize the spiritual potential in other people. Now, a story here before I tell you the third goal. Two years ago, Scott McKnight is speaking at Oklahoma Christian at a luncheon. Now, a lot of you aren't going to know who Scott McKnight is, but in the world of like biblical scholarship, he's a really, really big deal. He's written 20, 25 books, prolific author. He's been really, really helpful for me in my uh, study and, and what I know about the Bible. I'm a big Scott McKnight fan. So he's speaking at this luncheon in Oklahoma Christian, and I, I sign up to attend the luncheon. It's a buffet style, so I, I get my food, and I walk into the room, and I'm walking towards a table in the back when Grady King, who works at Oklahoma Christian as the church resources director, he calls my name. He's a friend of mine. He says, hey, Phil, come sit, sit with me. So I'm like, all right. So I walk over and I sit next to Grady, and Grady's on my left, and I look to my right, and Scott McKnight is sitting right there. And so I get nervous, like, oh man, I'm sitting right next to Scott McKnight, and what's going through my head is probably what would be going through your head if you were sitting next to someone quasi-famous, which is one, just make a good first impression, and two, just don't do anything stupid. Just don't say anything stupid, don't do anything stupid, just, just be normal, Phil. So I sit there, and I start engaging in small talk, you know, what book are you working on, blah, 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 things like that. And then I reach forward to grab my glass of water. <laughs> and I knock over my salad bowl, dressing included, right into the lap of Scott McKnight. <laughs> About three minutes before he gets up and addresses the entire room. Oh, I prayed that the Lord would give me a rock that I could crawl under, which he did not answer that prayer. Now, why is it that we really want to impress people that we think are important? Or for that matter, let me ask it this way, why is it that we so badly want the likes and the retweets and the followers on social media? Like, why? If I had to boil it down to one word, it would just be recognition. We want somebody else to look at us and say that you matter. And the irony is we spend so much time trying to seek the approval of people we barely know, hoping that these people we barely know can satisfy this deep, deep craving to be loved. So here's the third goal. Super simple. Be a hero in your own home. Be a hero in your own home. In other words, live the kind of life so that the people who are close to you are the very ones that think the most of you. Live your life so that it's your best friend and your sister and your mom and your dad and your kids, that they're the ones that think you're incredible, not the people that don't even know you very well. I mean, let's fast forward years from now or whenever that is to your own funeral. Do you want a hundred people saying generic things about you because they didn't know you very well? Or do you want three people saying amazing things about you because they knew you really, really well? Well, if you want that to be the end of your life, then maybe you should spend the days leading up to that day just being a hero at at home. I, I love the way that Paul ends the letter to Ephesians. So the, the first half of Ephesians is very deep and theological and it's pretty heady. And when he gets to the end of the book, he talks a lot about the home. So, so he, just to string a few of these verses together, Paul says, submit to your husbands. Uh, he says, love your wives. He says, honor your father and mother. Don't exasperate your kids. In other words, what he's saying is that gospel living, it actually starts in your living room. It starts with the people close to you. Like, like what, would you, what would your life look like if you actually made this your goal? Like if you just decided that this year you're going to stop chasing and you're going to start planting? Like this year I'm not going to chase. I'm not going to chase the likes. I'm not going to chase the followers. I'm not going to chase the approval from people that I don't, I, I don't even know. They don't know me. I'm just going to plant where I am. In, in my living room 
with my family, I'm going to be the hero. And those are going to be the people that, that love me. What would your year look like if you just gave up the chase and you planted where you are and you started just, just really focusing on the people in your home? I mean, think about this. It, when you play the fame game, like what's, where, where does it go? Like where does it lead? Like let's say that my moment in this lecture with Scott McKnight had not gone as badly as it did and I hadn't spilled my salad all over him and we had struck up some great conversation. Where, where does that lead? Well, it, it doesn't lead anywhere. It goes nowhere. Like th th there's no end to the road of, of fame. There's no way to win the fame game. In fact, learn from a few of these famous people. John Grisham, one of the most famous authors of all time, says this, you think you want fame, but then you get a good dose of it and realize it's highly overrated. Or Jim Carrey, one of the funniest people and one of the most famous actors of all time, says this, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they've ever dreamed of so they can see it is not the answer. Learn from these guys. In other words, and please hear me when I say this, never trade love for fame. Never trade love for fame. Be a hero in your home. Now, I preach at a large church. I've preached at a large church for, for a long time, and my heart is with our church family. I love Memorial Road. But because it's a large church, I get criticism here and there. It's always going to be the case. It's been the way the, my whole ministry career, and for the most part, I'm better at handling it now than I was 10 years ago, although sometimes it still gets under my skin. But when I, when I do get criticism, and it's not a lot, it's not all the time, but when I do get it, I generally try to listen to it. Is there anything I can learn from it? But then I, I just, I move on. And do you know why I do that? It's because criticism from people that know me the least pales in comparison to love from people that know me the best. I'll say that again. Criticism from people that know me the least pales in comparison to love from people that know me the best. And so the main way that I can go to bed at night and just move on when I do get criticism here and there is because of my, my home. Mary knows me better than anybody in the world. And Mary knows me on my really bad days. Like she knows my flaws. She knows my insecurities. She knows my weaknesses. Mary knows what it's like to be around me when I'm in a really, really bad mood. And she loves me. And because of that, I can go to bed at night and be okay with the world. It's because the, the people I know the best, they love me the most. And so what I'm saying is, what if you made that your goal this year? You just stopped chasing. And you started planting and said, I'm going to be a hero in my own home. You would have a pretty great year. So, do the best you can with what you have where you are. Maximize the spiritual potential in the people around you and be a hero in your own home.